Hi, and welcome back to Wisdom's Fire. This is a video series that I have been creating. This is the third uh, video in this series, and we're going to look at time in this one. But we're going to look at time in relationship to the text of Genesis 1, because this is a study of the text of Genesis 1 uh, from, of course, the Judeo-Christian faith perspective. So uh, I'd like to start this video by saying that um, there, there's a lot of confusion. Why in the text of Genesis 1, how is it that there is creation that happens before uh, the sun? How can the words be, let there be light, but there's no sun? Because we always associate um, light with sunlight. Well, there's a reason for that, and I'll get into that in future videos. But I'd like to show um, the importance. I think there was so much importance placed on the text of Genesis 1 to give the uh, people of Israel a time-keeping perspective. And I think the priestly authors wanted to give them not only a history of their time, but an experience of time. And so uh, what I'm going to get into today is how we look at experiencing time because of the movement of light. And, and then also a linear perspective of time and a circular perspective of time because both linear and circular perspectives are in the text of Genesis 1. And then finally, we'll end the video by looking at measured time. So let's turn to the experience of time to start out. And by the way, let's keep in mind that the audience to whom the Genesis account of creation was written was largely a, uh, an illiterate audience. And so the more visual aids uh, that the um, priestly writers could offer, the better. So let's understand that the priestly writers start their story of creation in the darkness. And as I said in previous videos, God is present in the darkness and God's spirit, Ruach, is also present in the darkness. Well, so then there is this slow dawning of light. So let's pretend for a second that something awakes us and it is maybe four o'clock in the morning or maybe 3.34 and we just can't fall back to sleep. But And, the, and there is no light and it is a really dark night. But we decide to get up, we pour ourselves a cup of coffee and we say, but it's so nice outside. I think what I'll do is I'll just go outside and I will wait for the sunrise. Okay, so let's experience, let's see what happens. So it's really, really dark. And as we sit there and the time is passing, things start to lighten up just a little bit. And so we have this, what would be called a pre-dawn light. This dark violet, um, it just begins to, things just begin to, it's still a little eerie though, because it's pretty dark, but it begins to lighten just ever so slightly. And in this pre-dawn light, we begin to be able to make out maybe some outlines or objects of things that we couldn't see prior to the pre-dawn light. Isaac Newton would call this color violet or indigo. This is this is um, the darkest color of the visible spectrum. So as we sit there, slowly, little by little, we begin to see a lightening of the sky. And as the sky uh, begins to um, brighten, um, maybe we can see maybe a, a few wispy clouds, but for sure we're beginning to see now objects, um, trees and rocks and whatever we can we can now see pretty well but still there's not too much color it's just that there is a light sky that's that's up there and then as we sit there we can begin to see the vegetation the green of the trees the green of the grass and finally 
the sunrise. Now, so this is an experience of time in the very wee hours of the morning, how illumination comes about as time as we are waiting for the sunrise. Now, in the text of Genesis 1, this is in the beginning. This is let there be light. This is and there was the sky and there was land and green vegetation and there was the sun, the moon and the stars. So you see that the priestly writer is taking the color order of the visible spectrum of light or in ancient language, the color order of the rainbow, taking those colors in the order in which they appear and creating a story of creation. Now, there are three more colors to talk about. The living, cre this is a light, this is a life support system, light sky, land, plant, sun, moon, and stars. This is what supports life on earth. And now we are ready to add, <coughs> excuse me, the living creatures into the creation. And so now we are in the orange and red range of light. Why would the living creatures be represented by orange and red? Orange, I don't think, was necessarily a color um, in the vocabulary of ancient Israelites. It would have been uh, light red and dark red. So, but why are we in the red range of light? Because when we look at the animal kingdom, we, we look at the animals, we do not see red. Okay, so we look at the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and we don't see red. Okay, so maybe there can be a case for a goldfish. <laughs> but other than that, we are not seeing red. Now, but this is living creatures. And so now we have into the creation a flow of life, blood. And this is so important in, uh, in the Israelite story and in ancient cultures. Life blood was everything. It's how you, um, it, 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 it is really the very core and soul of being a living being is that you have life blood. So now we have in the beginning, day one, two, three, four, day five, day six, and now you have the only color left, and that is the seventh day. Now we know scientifically that this is an extra spectral color, and I will get into that later. But it is a visible color because um, the rainbow is a circle of light. And so there is this connection between the dark blue or the violet end of the spectrum and the red end of the spectrum. And when the violet and red end of the spectrum comes together as a circle, it creates this color purple. But we'll get into all of that. The point is that the story follows a color order and that is why the text is so highly structured and highly ordered, because there is a purpose to each one of these um, days that, and what is being created on these days. The purpose is to follow this color order. Okay, so that's the experience of light. Now let's talk about the... Um, linear perspective of time, or this, the experience of time, I meant to say, by observing light. Now, the story is told in a seven-day linear perspective, and we know this, and we also know that we experience time as a linear phenomenon. One day leads to the next and so forth. So we, we see time and think about time linearly. And now that we have seen that it follows the color order of the visible spectrum, the story, so now we see that it's 
a linear following, as I just uh, as I just showed with these uh, colors. But there's also a circular aspect to the story. So we've covered the experience. This is the linear perspective. Now the circular perspective comes in with the phrase, and there was evening, and there was morning. And there was evening, and it's a passage of time. And there was morning. So what it does is it offers us a passage of time on each of these six days of work, and then, of course, the seventh day, um, there is not a completion on that day. It does, the text does not end with, and there was evening and there was morning, so there's no circle here, although, the, although time is passing. We'll get to that in a future video. But we have this experience that is circular, and it's, it's kind of like a child's slinky toy because you don't, you don't just come to an end of a day and then have everything stop. No, um, it's at, when you are uh, taking a revolution of time on one day and there was evening and there was morning, by the time you get to morning, you're already into the next day and there was evening and there was morning. So it's like a child's slinky toy that goes round and round, but it also is on a linear perspective or yeah, a linear trajectory. So now if we combine the uh, circular perspective of time, the linear perspective of time and the colors of the rainbow, we end up with a time perspective that looks very similar to this. We have a color wheel representing each one of the days of creation. Now, remember, the story follows these colors. So as the story is told, the entities begin to, like the light, there's a light that is going to be filling on this first day and then the sky on this second day and then land and vegetation on this third day, the sun, moon, and stars by the fourth day. And then we have half of the color wheel completed by that point. So there is a filling in and a completing of each one of these days as the story is told. Now, let me quickly uh, defend the use of a circle that is divided uh, into segments. In this case, it's divided into segments that um, color is put into those segments. But let's understand that ancient timekeeping methods, it was all divided circles, uh, stone circles. Stonehenge, uh, ancient sundials were circles or half circles with divisions in them. And then ancient zodiacs had 12 divisions um, around the zodiac. And uh, in 8th century, which may have been a time frame in which the oral story of Genesis 1 may have originated, uh, it's a pretty old story. So in 8th century, um, when creation stories were were uh, coming about, the sun god Shamash, in, in the British Museum of Natural History, there is a, a stone relief of the sun god Shamash, and Shamash is sitting on his throne, and he has this apparatus that is coming out uh, from behind his body on this throne and comes over top of his head, and then from this apparatus there is this um, I, chain or rope or whatever hold, that comes down and it's holding a circular sun disk and the sun disk has eight divisions in it. The point that I'm trying to make is that long before Genesis 1 was perfected as the text we know today, which could most likely have been um, uh, 6th century um, before 6th century, uh, after the exile, during or after the exile. Let's understand how important timekeeping was to those people who were living at that time, because not only were they in exile and pulling together their stories, but they needed to tell their story. 
They needed to know their history. Timekeeping was extremely important to them. And at that point in human history, we had not yet perfected a, um, a, a calendar. We had, we, had, we had a 365 day calendar, but we hadn't agreed on our timekeeping calendars. Like now the whole world has agreed on, uh, on the calendar we use today. Um, but the, but um, time blanking on the calendar, oh, the Gregorian calendar that we use today. Um, but at the time of the writing of these texts, there was not a wide agreement on whose calendar was the calendar that was going to rule. At any rate, timekeeping was extremely uh, an extremely important aspect to life on Earth for the ancients. And I think we don't often give it uh, the, I don't think we give it the attention that it needs. And certainly when we try to interpret the text of Genesis 1, timekeeping is, we're all wondering how, what this timekeeping is all about. What is a day? Uh, you know, we're all wondering that, but we don't really focus in on what the methodology might have been in this text. So I am defending for anyone who is questioning, uh, would it be possible for the ancients to think of, to be creative enough to design a circle a, to tell their story and put colors in that circle? Yeah, I believe that it would have been, um, they were, they had already designed zodiacs and had all kinds of images in their zodiacs. So this would not have been a stretch for the human imagination at that time to fill their uh, wheel of light with images of creation. So now let's get on one very briefly. Let's get on to some measurement of or some timekeeping uh, measurements. So. In the text of Genesis 1, because we divide the day in half, and there was evening, and there was morning, we have established a morning and evening perspective. So the color wheel is divided in half. But let's also realize that we can then divide the day in uh, into fours, because we can provide a... Um, noon and a midnight hour as well, because we, ha we now have an orientation around this wheel. So we have dawn, noon, sundown, and midnight. The noon hour and the midnight hour are um, assumed because of the division the and there was evening and there was morning division. Now let's also understand that when there is, when we are in the presence of this light, let's also understand there really is no, even though there's sundown, there is no sundown. This is, these are conceptual hours. It's the idea of a passage of time. It really doesn't have anything to do with the sun or the moon or the stars. And there is no darkness, even though it's midnight, there is no darkness because we are looking at a clock now of light. Okay, so now let's get into this uh, seventh day of time because it is on the seventh day. Here. It is on the seventh day, this purple day, that humans began measuring time. There are six days to the uh, Genesis account of creation, and then the seventh day is God's uh, day of rest. I'm going to put this back so that it's not... Okay, there. Um, so we have... Um, we have timekeeping beginning about, now this is all of these six days. This is time before measured time. No one is measuring time. There is no time measurement going on. It is an experience of time, both linearly and circularly. 
But when we get into the seventh day, humans do begin measuring time. Um, now, what the gap is between the sixth day and the seventh day, who knows, because the six days of creation can be millions and billions of years. But about 10 to 12,000 years ago, we began in earnest to measure time. Um, we, we started uh, moving from hunter-gatherers into um, becoming agrarian, becoming farmers. And we needed to know when to plant, when, when, when would this crop eventually be harvested so that would feed our family and how many times per the calendar year. So we needed to understand time. But even though we started measuring time in earnest, uh, time was marked probably for tens of thousands of years. Uh, a, a marking of the passage of time, yes, but I'm talking about measuring time to keep record, to record, to understand the passage of time, to to um, to remember it. So we needed not only memory, but to develop memory, but we needed to um, to have mathematical skills that we didn't have. So the measurement of time was not an easy, it was an enigma for the human mind. It was not easy to master. And so our first calendar never, um, we never had a first calendar until about 5,500 years ago. That's the earliest calendar that we know of. That's 365 days. Now that brings us to how we arrived at that 365 day measurement. Now we're now we are beyond the Sabbath day now. Okay. So we measured started measuring time on the Sabbath day. The Sabbath day ended and then we moved into an eighth day of creation, which I will get to in future videos. But let's understand that the discovery of the dog star in the constellation uh, Canis Major, that is really what led us to understanding our 365 day annual type of measurement of time. And um, because we were able to spot that dog star and the, the rising sun and how it was relating to the dog star every 365 days, because we were able to do that, um, there were also other constellations we were uh, observing. So fast forward, by the time the Genesis account of creation, by the, by the time this account of creation is being written, we now have astronomers that are noticing a not a micro, um, not not 24 hour, 365 day measurement of time, not our not our micro management of time, but they were beginning to notice. Um, a larger measurement of time that they called the ages. In the Bible, it's called from age to age or past ages or ages to come or the age to come. Uh, we have several references like that in our Bible. Well, that's because by the time the Genesis account of creation, this account was being written and finalized, the astronomers had picked up on this larger measurement, but they hadn't perfected it yet, but that's why we had the zodiacs, the ancient zodiacs. They hadn't perfected it yet, but by the time of Hipparch, but uh, so the Genesis account of creation is being written when the awareness is there of the ages, but the perfection of the math is not there. By the time uh, Hip the astronomer Hipparchus came along 100 years before Jesus' birth, 100 BCE. That's when the measurement that we still use um, for these ages, that's when that measurement was perfected. Let's understand that that measurement is what we call today the procession around the equinox. And the measurement is approximately 2,160 years per age. And so now we have these larger seasons of time or these larger ages of time. So we have unmeasured time in the text of Genesis 1. 
we have a day of rest in which we moved into measured time. And that is this kind of measured time. And then by the time that the Genesis account of creation is being perfected, we now know age to age time. And that's a larger perspective of time. So by the time Jesus is with us on the face of the earth, age to age time or the procession around the equinox has been perfected and it is now known. So there are two realms of temporal time, the micro picture of time, which is this clock and this 365 day calendar that we uh, go by that rules our world. And then we also have an age to age time, which is uh, the press procession around the equinox, which is the larger perspective of time. Jesus understood both realms of temporal time, which I will get into in future videos. So thank you for watching this. Um, please join us. Be, join me when I move forward because we are going to go and look into these. We are going to look into how these each one of these days is filled and it's going to bring to light a language of creation, um, a spiritual language. This is a Genesis one is a really important story and we have uh, relegated it to the bin of mythology, but um, let's before we throw that into the bin of mythology and say that we don't need to worry about it. Let's we don't need to worry about it. But before we need to take it serious, uh, say we don't need to take it seriously. Let's continue to take it seriously for just a little while longer so that we find some things that are at deeper levels. And I will see you on the next video. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.